Chapter 7 of The Bell Jar by Sylvia Plath <clears throat> Of course, Constantine was much too short, but in, it, but in his own way, he was handsome, with light brown hair and dark blue eyes, and a lively, challenging, challenging expression. He could almost have been an American. He was so tan and had such good teeth but I could tell straight away that he wasn't. He had what no American man I've ever met has had, and that's intuition. From the start, Constantine guessed I wasn't any protege of Mrs. Willard's. I raised an eyebrow here and dropped a dry little laugh there, then pretty soon <clears throat> we were both openly raking Mrs. Willard over the coals, and I thought, this Constantine won't mind if I'm too tall and don't know enough languages and haven't been to Europe. He'll see through all of that stuff to what I really am. Constantine drove me to the UN in his old green convertible with cracked, comfortable brown leather seats and the top down. He told me his tan came from playing tennis. And when we were sitting there side by side flying down the streets in the open sun, he took my hand and squeezed it. And I felt happier than I had ever been since I was about nine and running along the hot white beaches with my father the summer before he died. And while Constantine and I sat in one of those hushed, plush auditoriums in the UN next to a stern, muscular Russian girl with no makeup, who was a simultaneous interpreter like Constantine, I thought how strange it had never occurred to me before that I was only purely happy until I was nine years old. After that, in spite of the Girl Scouts and the piano lessons and the watercolor lessons and the dancing lessons and the sailing camp, all of which my mother scrimped to give me, in college with crewing in the mist before breakfast and black bottom pies and the little new fr firecrackers of ideas going off every day, I had never been really happy again. I stared through the Russian girl in her double-breasted gray suit, rattling off idiom after idiom in her own unknowable tongue, which Constantine said was the most difficult part because the Russians didn't have the same idioms as our idioms, and I wished with all of my heart I could crawl into her and spend the rest of my life barking out one idiom after another. It mightn't make me any happier, but it would be one more little pebble of efficiency among all the other pebbles. Then Constantine and the Russian girl interpreter, and the whole bunch of black and white and yellow men arguing down there behind their labeled microphones, microphones, <clears throat> seemed to move off at a distance. I saw their mouths going up and down without a sound, as if, as if they were sitting on the deck of a departing ship, stranding me in the middle of a huge silence. I started adding up all of the all the things I couldn't do. I began with cooking. My grandmother and my mother were such good cooks that I left everything to them. They were always trying to teach me one dish or another, but I would just look on and say, yes, yes, I see, while the instructions slid through my head like water, and then I'd always spoil what I did so nobody would ask me to do it again. I remember Jody, my best and only girlfriend in college my freshman year, making me scrambled eggs at her house one morning. They tasted unusual, and when I asked her if she had put in anything extra, she said cheese and garlic salt. I asked her, I asked who told her to do that, and she said nobody. She just thought it up. But then she was practical and a sociology major. I didn't know shorthand either. This meant I couldn't get a good job after college. My mother kept telling me nobody wanted a plain English major, but an English major who knew shorthand was something else again. Everybody would want her. She would be in demand among all the up-and-coming young men, and she would transcri transcribe letter after thrilling letter. The trouble was, I hated the idea of serving men in any way. I wanted to dictate my own thrilling letters. Besides, those little shorthand symbols in the book my mother showed me seemed as just as bad as let T equal time and let S equal the total distance. My list grew longer. 
I was a terrible dancer. I couldn't carry a tune. I had no sense of balance, and when we had to walk down a narrow board with our hands out and a book on our heads in gym class, I always fell over. I couldn't ride a horse or ski, the two things I wanted to do most, because they cost too much money. I couldn't speak German or read Hebrew or write Chinese. I didn't even know where most of the old out-of-the-way countries the UN men in front of me represented fitted out on the map. For the first time in my life, sitting there in the soundproof heart of the UN building between Konstantin, who could play tennis as well as simultaneous interp simultaneously interpret, and the Russian girl who knew so many idioms, <coughs> I felt dreadfully inad inadequate. The trouble was, I had been inadequate all along. I simply hadn't thought about it. The one thing I was good at was winning scholarships and prizes, and that era was coming to an end. I felt like a racehorse in a world without racetracks, or a champion college footballer suddenly confronted by Wall Street in a business suit. His days of glory shrunk to a little gold cup on his mantle, with a date engraved on it like the date on a tombstone. I saw my life breaking out before me, like the green fig tree in the story, from the tip of every branch, like a fat purple fig, a wonderful future beckoned and winked. One fig was a husband and a happy home and children, and another fig was a famous poet, and another fig was a brilliant professor, and another fig was E.G., the amazing editor, and another fig was Europe and Africa and South America, and another fig was Constantine and Socrates and Attila and a pack of other lovers with queer names and offbeat professions, and another fig was an Olympic lady crew champion, and beyond and above these figs were, so, were many more figs I couldn't quite make out. I saw myself sitting in, the, in this crotch of the fig tree, starving to death, just because I couldn't make up my mind which of the figs I would choose. I wanted each and every one of them, but choosing one fig meant losing all the rest, and... I sat there, unable to decide. The figs began to wrinkle and go black, and one by one, they plopped to the ground at my feet. Constantine's restaurant smelled of herbs and spices and sour cream. All the time I had been in New York, I had never found such a restaurant. I only found those heavenly hamburgers. <coughs> heavenly hamburger places where they serve giant hamburgers and soup of the day and four kinds of fancy cake at a very clean counter facing a long, glary mirror. To reach this restaurant, we had to climb down seven dimly lit steps into a sort of cellar. cellar. Travel posters plastered the smoke-dark walls, like so many picture windows overlooking Swiss lakes and Japanese mountains and African veils and thick, dusty bottle candles that seemed for centuries to have wept their colored waxes over red over blue over green in a fine three-dimensional lace, cast a circle of light around each table where the faces floated flushed and flame-like themselves. <clears throat> I don't know what I ate. But I felt immensely better after the first mouthful. It occurred to me that my vision of the fig tree and all the fat fig figs that withered and fell to the earth might well have arisen from the profound void of an empty stomach. Constantine kept refilling our glasses with a sweet Greek wine that tasted of pine bark and I found myself telling him how I was going to learn German and go to Europe and be a war correspondent like Ma Mer Maggie Higgins. I felt so fine by the time we came to the yogurt and strawberry jam that I decided I would let Con Constantine se seduce me. Ever since Buddy Willard had told me about that waitress, I had been thinking I ought to go out and sleep with somebody myself. Sleeping with Buddy wouldn't count, though, because he would still be one person ahead of me. It would have to be with somebody else. The only boy I, I ever actually discussed, go, 
discussed going to bed with was a bitter, hawk-nosed southerner from Yale who came up to college one weekend only to find his date had eloped with a taxi driver the day before. As the girl had lived in my house, and I was the only one home that particular night, it was my job to cheer him up. At the local coffee shop, hunched in one of the secretive high-backed booths with hundreds of people's names gouged into the wood, we drank cup after, after cup of black black coffee and talked frankly about sex. This boy, his name was Eric, said he thought it disgusting the way all the girls in my college stood around on the porches under the porch lights and in the bushes in plain view, necking madly before the one o'clock curfew so everybody passing by could see them. A million years of evolution, Eric said bitterly. And what are we? Animals. Then Eric told me how he had slept with his first woman. He went to a southern prep school that specialized in building all-around gentlemen. And by the time he graduated, it was an unwritten rule that you had to have known a woman. Known in a biblical sense, Eric said. So one Saturday, Eric and a few of his classmates took a bus into the nearest city and visited a no notorious whorehouse. Eric's <clears throat> Eric's whore hadn't even taken off her dress. She was a fat, middle-aged woman with dyed red hair and suspiciously thick lips and rat-colored skin, and she wouldn't turn off the light. So, so he had her under a fly-spotted 25-watt bulb, and it was nothing like it was cracked up to be. It was as boring as going to the toilet. I said maybe if you loved a woman, it wouldn't seem so boring, but Eric said it would be spoiled by thinking this woman, too, was just an animal like the rest. So if he loved anybody, he would never go to bed with her. He'd go to a whore if he had to and keep the woman he loved free of all that dirty business. It had crossed my mind at the time that Eric might be a good person to go to bed with, since he had already done it, and unlike the usual run-up boys, didn't seem dirty-minded or silly when he talked about it. But then Eric wrote me a letter saying he thought he might really be able to love me. I was so intelligent and cynical, and yet had such a kind face, surprisingly like his older sister's. So I knew it was no use. I was the type he would never go to bed with, and I and wrote him I was unfortunately about to marry a childhood sweetheart. The more I thought about it, the better... I liked the idea of being seduced by a simultaneous interpreter in New York City. Constantin seemed mature and considerate in every way. There were no people I knew who would want to brag about it the way college boys bragged about sleeping with girls in the back of their cars to their roommates or their friends on the basketball team. And there would be a pleasant irony in sleeping with the man Mrs. Willard had introduced me to as if she were, in a roundabout way, to blame for it. When Constantin asked... <clears throat> when Constantin asked if I would like to come up to his apartment to hear some Balalaika records, I smiled to myself. My mother had always told me never, under any circumstances, to go with a man to a man's room after an evening out. It could mean only the one thing. I am very fond of Bala Laika music, I said. Constantin's room had a balcony, and the balcony overlooked the river, and we could hear the hooing of the tugs down in the darkness. I felt moved and tender and perfectly certain about what I was going to do. I knew I might have a baby, but that thought hung far and dim in the distance and didn't trouble me at all. There was no, there was no 100% sure way of not to have a baby. It said in an article my mother cut out of the Reader's Digest and mailed to me at college. This article was written by a married woman lawyer with children and called In Defense of Chastity. It gave all the reasons a girl shouldn't sleep with anybody but her husband and then only after and then only after they were married. The main point of the article was that a man's world is different from a woman's world and a man's emotions are different from a woman's emotions and only marriage can bring the two worlds and the two different sets of emotions together properly. 
My mother said this was something a girl didn't know about till it was too late. So, so she had to take the advice of people who were already experts, like a married woman. This woman lawyer, lawyer said the best men wanted to be pure for their wives. And even if they weren't pure, they wanted to be the ones to teach their wives about sex. Of course, they would try to persuade a girl and say they would marry her later, but as soon as she gave in, they would lose all respect for her and start saying that if she did that with them, she would go... She would do that with other men, and they would end up making their, her life miserable. The woman finished her article by saying, Better safe than sorry, and besides, there was no sure way of not getting stuck with a baby, and then you'd really be in a pickle. Now, the one thing this article didn't seem to, didn't seem to me to consider was how a girl felt. It might be nice to be pure, and then to marry a pure man. But what if he suddenly confessed he wasn't pure, after we were married the way Buddy Willard had. I couldn't stand the idea of a woman having to have one si have a single pure life and a man being able to have a double life, one pure and one not. Finally, I decided that if it was so difficult to find a red-blooded, intelligent man who was still pure by the time he was 21, I might as well forget about staying pure myself and marry somebody who wasn't pure either. Then he had started to make my life mi miserable, I could make his miserable as well. When I was 19, pureness was the great issue. Instead of the world being divi 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 divided up into Catholics and Pro Protestants or Republicans and Democrats or white men and black men or even men and women, I saw the world divi divi di divided. Into people, into into people who had slept with somebody and people who who hadn't, and this seemed the only really significant difference 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 between one person and another. I thought a spectacular change would come over me the day I I crossed the boundary boundary line. I thought it would be the way I'd feel if I ever visited Europe. I'd come home. And if I looked closely into the mirror, I might be able to make out a little white elf at the back of my eye. Now I thought if I looked into the mirror tomorrow, I'd see a doll-sized Constantine sitting in my eye and smiling out at me. Well, for about an hour, we lounged on Constantine's balcony in two separate slingback chairs with the Victrola playing and the Balalaika record stacked between us. A faint, milky light diffused from the street streetlights or the half-moon or the cars or the stars. I couldn't tell what, but apart from holding my hand, Constantine showed no desire to seduce me whatsoever. I asked if he was engaged or had any special girlfriend, thinking maybe that's what was the matter, but he said no. He made a point of keeping clear of such attachments. At last I felt a powerful drowsiness drifting through my veins from all that pipe, pine bark wine I had drunk. I think I'll go in and lie down, I said. I strolled casually into the bedroom and stooped over to nudge off my shoes. The clean bed bobbed before me like a safe boat. I stretched full length and shut my eyes. Then I heard Constantine sigh and come in from the balcony. One by one, his shoes clonked onto the floor, and he lay down by my side. I looked at him secretly from under a fall of hair. He was lying on his back, his hands under his head, staring at the ceiling. The starched white sleeves of his shirt rolled up to the elbows glimmered eerily in the half-dark, and his tan skin almost seemed black. I thought he must be the most beautiful man I'd ever seen. I thought if I had only a keen, shapely bone structure to my face, or I could discuss politics shrewdly, or was a famous writer, Constantine might find me interesting enough to sleep with. And then I wondered if, as soon as he came to like me, he would sink into or ordinarian ordinariness, and if, as soon as he came to love me, I would find fault after fault the way I did with Buddy Willard and the boys before him. The same thing happened over and over. I would catch sight of some flawless man off in the distance, but as soon as he moved closer, I immediately saw he wouldn't do it all. That's one of the reasons I never wanted to get married. The last thing I wanted was infinite security and to be, a, and to be the place an arrow shoots off from. I wanted change and excitement and to shoot off in all directions myself, like the colored arrows from a 4th of July rocket.
I woke to the sound of rain. It was pitch dark. After a while, I deciphered the faint outlines of an unfamiliar window. Every so often, a beam of light appeared out of thin air, traversed the wall like a ghostly exploratory finger, and slid off into nothing again. Then I heard the sound of somebody breathing. At first, I thought it was only myself, and that I was lying in the dark in my hotel room after being poisoned. I held my breath, but the breathing kept on. A green eye glowed on the bed beside me. It was defi divided into quarters like a compass. I reached out slowly and closed my hand on it. I lifted it up. With it came an arm, heavy as a dead man's, but warm with sleep. Constantine's watch said three o'clock. He was lying in his shirt and trousers and stocking feet just as I had left him when I dropped asleep. And, then, and as my eyes grew used to the darkness, I made out his pale eyelids and his straight nose and his tolerant, shapely mouth. But they seemed insubstantial, as if drawn on fog. For a few minutes, I leaned over, studying him. I had never fallen asleep beside a man before. I tried to imagine what it would be like if Constantine were my husband. It would mean getting up at seven and cooking him eggs and bacon and toast and coffee and dawdling about in my nightgown and curlers after he'd left for work to wash up the dirty plates and make up the bed. And then we, when he came home after our lively, fascinating day, he'd ex expect a big dinner. And I'd spend the evening washing up even more dirty plates till I fell into bed, utterly exhausted. This seemed a dreary and wasted life for a girl with 15 years of straight A's. But I knew that's what marriage was like, because cook and clean and wash was just what Buddy Will Willard's mother did from morning till night, and she was the wife of a university professor and had been a private school teacher herself. Once when I visited Buddy, I found Mrs. Willard braiding a rug out of strips of wool from Mr. Willard's old suits. She'd spent weeks on that rug, and I had admired the tweedy browns and greens and blues patterning the braid. But after Mrs. Willard had was through, instead of hanging the rug on the wall the way I would have done, she put it down in, a pl in place of her kitchen mat. And in a few days, it was soiled and dull and indistinguishable from any mat you could buy for under a dollar in the five and ten. And I knew that in spite of all the roses and kisses and restaurant dinners, a man showered on a woman before he married her. What he secretly wanted was the wedding service ended what he secretly wanted when this this when the wedding service ended was her to flatten out beneath underneath his feet like Mrs. Willard's kitchen mat. Hadn't my own mother told me that as soon as she and my father left Reno on their honeymoon, my father had been married before, so he needed a, a diver, divorce. My father said to her, Whew, that's a relief. Now we can stop pretending and be ourselves. And from that day on, my mother n never had a minute's peace. I also remembered Buddy Willard saying in a s sinister, knowing way that after I had children, I would feel differently, and I wouldn't want to write poems anymore. So I began to think maybe it was true that when you were married and had children, it was like being brainwashed, and afterward you went about as dumb as a slave in some private, totalitarian state. As I stared down at Constantine the way you stare down at a bright, unattainable pebble in the, at the bottom of a deep well, his eyelids lifted and he looked through me, and his eyes were full of love. I watched dumbly as a shudder of rec recognition clicked across the blur of tenderness and the wide pupils went glossy and deathless as patent leather. Constantine sat up, yawning. What time is it? Three. I said in a flat voice. I better go home. I have to be at work first thing in the morning. I'll drive you. As we sat back, back as we sat back to back on our separate sides of the bed, fumbling with our shoes in the horrid, cheerful white light of the bed lamp, I sensed Constantine turn round. Is your hair always like that? Like what? He didn't answer, but reached over and put his hand at the root of my hair and ran his fingers up slowly to the tip ends, like a comb. A little electric shock flared through me, and I sat quite still. Ever since I was small, I loved feeling somebody comb my hair. 
and made me go all sleepy and peaceful. Ah, uh, I know what it is, Constantine said. You've just washed it. And he bent to lay lace up his tennis shoes. An hour later, I lay in my hotel bed, listening to the rain. It didn't even sound like rain. It sounded like a tap running. The ache in the middle of my left shin bone came to life, and I abandoned any hope of sleep before seven, when my radio alarm clock would rouse me with its hearty renderings of Sosa. Every time it rained, the old leg rake seemed to remember itself, and what it remembered was a dull hurt. Then I thought, Buddy Willard made me, made me break that leg. Then I thought, no, I broke it myself. I broke it on purpose to pay myself back for being such a heel. End of chapter 7